So if you're new with us, here at Calvary Chapel East Dulwich, what we do is we go through the Bible and we go through the Bible book by book, um, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, sometimes letter by letter. <laughs> and, um, and in that way, we do our best not to, um, to, to teach the scriptures within its context and to teach the scriptures in, in the sense of what it meant to the first-hand hearers. And then what it meant to the first-hand hearers and then what does it mean to us today? And so that's the, the, the task for us today. We're going through the, Paul's second letter, his epistle to the Corinthians. We began this journey last week. We looked at a few verses and an overview of first, second Corinthians last week. And um, we considered how Paul wrote this letter from, you know, it's, very, it's a personal letter, right? And, you know, it's the most intimate letter of most people say that he wrote and it's, he writes it from a place of personal hurt and despair because people were basically attacking him um, and these people were specifically from the church in Corinth, a church which he had planted and he had sort of like a deep connection with and deep love for. And so with the authority of an ap apostle, he opens up his letter and basically says who he is you know, that he's Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, but a will of God. So it wasn't his idea. He didn't just wake up one morning and think, I'm going to be apostle of Jesus. <laughs> you know, the Lord arrested his heart. You can read about it in Acts 9, where the whole, you know, the Lord you know, decked him on his way to Damascus. And, you know, his conversion was very, very unique. And so, you know, he says these things. And Paul writes this letter as I said, it has a very different tone to 1 Corinthians, which is corrective. But Paul writes this letter because he wants to squash the beef, right? He doesn't want to have arms house. We good with that? He doesn't want to have beef with people. You know, he wants to live peaceably with all men. And so he writes this letter to, to show the Corinthians who didn't agree with him, who didn't like him, who didn't rate him, that to show his genuineness of heart. That, you know, he wasn't a charlatan. He wasn't trying to get anything out of it apart from just fulfill the will of God for his life, which was to preach the gospel. Woe is me if I don't preach the gospel. And so he, he, moved, he wrote this letter to, to really just to share his heart with these believers in Corinth. And so, as I said, trying to keep this in context, I'm going to try and read the first 11 verses. And it's tongue twisters, so you've got to bear with me, right? Because it's quite repetitive. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. We there? Amen. Amen. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints who are in Acacia, or Achaia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us, in all tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Now, if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or if we are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope for you is steadfast, because we know that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so also you will be partakers of the consolation. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble, which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. You also helping together in prayer for us that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift granted to us through many. Hallelujah. Amen. Right. So I mentioned last week that as I read this, you probably would have gathered that there's a lot of tribulation, trouble, suffering, 
affliction going on here, right? Did we, did we pick up on that, right? And so obviously Paul's drawing our attention to something. What do you think he's drawing our attention to? Tri tribulation, <laughs> trouble, suffering, affliction. Because the life of the believer is almost guaranteed to involve some form of, of suffering. Doesn't sound like fun, does it? Why would you sign up for a life of suffering? Why would you be a believer? Why would you? Why? Because it's true, right? <laughs> because Jesus is the truth. But it doesn't sound like fun. And we know that we endure suffering because ultimately it goes back to where? It goes back to the beginning. It goes back to the garden. It goes back to the fall. It goes back to sin in entering into the world. And so because sin enters in the world, we are now subject to, to suffering. It doesn't mean everyone's guaranteed to get suffering, but, you know, the life of the believer can be categorized of a life of suffering. And I said last week that the scripture says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trials. Is there something strange as has happened to you? <coughs> it's the life of the believer Amen. that we may endure suffering. And, and depending on your, your, um, your end times perspective or how you see scripture, I see scripture as being cyclical. And so I see scripture being fulfilled, but then you have multiple fulfillments, but then you have an ultimate fulfillment, right? And, you know, Jesus says, so in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the son of, of man. So we can kind of like get a picture of what happened in the beginning to kind of like see like, oh, it's going to be something like that towards the end. Because Jesus said it, right? Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. And so suffering was there at the beginning. Suffering was there with Jesus's ministry. So guess what, family? Suffering could be there towards the end of time. And I believe that we're fastly uh, approaching the time of Jesus' return. Amen? amen. Maranatha, Lord Jesus. Comes. Can I get an amen for that one? <coughs> Hallelujah. But suffering, as I said, entered into the world from the beginning. And we suffer because we've also got an enemy who actually hates us. I mean, I, did you know that? He actually hates you. And when you became a believer, you put a, a target on your back. And on your front as well. <laughs> and he just likes taking pops at you. You know, whether it's in thought, word, or deed, he likes to take a pop at you to see how you're going to act, how you're going to respond. And Jesus himself said that Satan's role is to kill, steal, and destroy, or destroy. And so, beloved, if you're going through difficulty this morning, do not think it's strange. <coughs> It's part and parcel of the life of the believer, amen? And Paul's getting to that. And Paul wants us to know that suffering can become a reality in our lives. But Paul wants us to know that even through the suffering, guess what? God has got us. God is, God is with us. He says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Now, they're not just throwaway words. They're words we can hold on to say, do you know what, Lord? I don't know what's going on right now. Everything seems messy. There's drama going on but you got me. You're with me. And that's easier said than done, right? Because normally when we go through drama, we want to do everything we can to try and work out the drama ourselves. And Paul's going to get to something. He's going to say, don't trust in yourself. Trust in him. And so Paul wants us to know that even though we're, getting, we're experiencing, we could be experiencing suffering, God is still the God of all comfort. He was the God of all comfort with Job. Remember the story about Job? Joseph, what about Joseph? Still the God of all comfort with Joseph. Still the, the God of all comfort with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or Hadonai, Azariah, and Mishael, depends on which names you want to call them. Still the God of all comfort with Daniel. So we look to these examples and we take comfort in these examples because if God is with them, he's also with us, right? And so they all experience difficulty with within their lives but God was with them so we jump into verse 2 and Paul says grace to you and peace from God and the Lord Jesus Christ and again grace and peace are not just throwaway throwaway words you know grace 
we know what grace means. It means God's unmerited favor. It means getting what we don't deserve. You don't deserve, I don't deserve grace, but God gives us grace. He's unmerited favor. And so we get what we don't deserve. Peace, what about peace? I mentioned it last week. Now, I mean, usually when I'm on the phone and I'm saying goodbye to someone, I say, peace, yeah, peace, peace, peace. Anybody else? It's something I do, but the word is much stronger in, in Hebrew, right? It's shalom. And it shalom means, as I said last week, it's all the best that I could possibly wish or want for you. All the, the, the best that God could wish or want for you in, 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 in your life, in health, in business, in your family, you know? Shalom. And we know that through Christ Jesus, through his sacrifice on the cross, we now have the peace of God in our thought life in particular. We're, not, we're no longer enemies with God. But now we have the peace with God. We have peace of God and peace with God. And that's a, that's a good place to be in. And Paul says that this peace, this grace and this peace, it comes from God the Father and God the Son. And so we look at this and we say it's the Godhead which is sending this stuff our way. Now, not to go too far down this road, but that's important as well because we're Trinitarian, right? We believe in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We're not Unitarian. And so big debates. But here we clearly see, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, right? Grace to you and peace from God our, fa God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, amen? amen. You've got to hold on to these verses, guys, because if you get into debate with anyone, and I'm hoping you will as you share the good news of the gospel with friends and family. But we see the Trinity there, right? So the, the Godhead is sending grace, sending peace our way. And that's a good thing to know. You know, to know that what? The creator of all things is giving me unmerited favor. That's a deep thought. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. So what Paul's doing here now, he knows that he's received this grace and this peace from God. What's he doing? Sending it back. He's sending the thanks, the blessedness back to the Godhead. And why is he doing this? Because Paul is highlighting that he has this personal relationship with the Godhead. He has a relationship with, with the Father. He has a relationship with, with the Son. He has a relationship with the Holy Spirit. I don't know if you remember, it was Jesus who basically spoke to him on the road to Damascus, right? Amen? It was the Holy Spirit who spoke to him, we don't know how, but spoke to him and said, don't go over to Macedonia, was it Macedonia he wasn't meant to go, or Asia, but go over to Macedonia, one of those places. And so we know that the Holy Spirit speaks. And so he has a relationship with the Godhead. And so through all of Paul's, I mentioned it last week, and I think it's in chapter 11, through all the experiences which, which Paul had, the stonings, the lashings, the beating with rods, the shipwrecks, the persecution, being abused, being robbed. Paul, what, what did he, he learnt how to trust in God. And that's the journey we're all on, right? We, we don't become Christians and we know how to trust in God. <laughs> it's a process which, you know, through different experiences, different trials, we learn, oh, in that situation, I trusted on myself. But in that situation, do you know what? I did my best to give it over to God. I, I, I prayed about it. I covered it with prayer. I spoke to people. I got wise counsel. I gave it over to the Lord and and allowed the Lord just to speak into the situation. You see, we learn how to trust in God. And so because Paul has this personal relationship with the Godhead and he's learning this stuff because he's not, he's not the finished article. 
He's sending a blessing back to the Godhead. Thank you for having me. All that you've done for me, you're keeping me. I'm sending the blessing back. And that's just a wonderful thing. Um, we see that Paul sends the blessing back to the Godhead. And, and he says something interesting in this verse as well because he says, um, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of all mercies and God of all comfort. Now, in the Old Testament, you'd usually read, Blessed be the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? And he, he is that. But in the New Testament, you don't read that anymore. In the New Testament, he is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see? God now reveals himself as Father. Something which the Jews back in the day had no concept of. Because they saw God as being so holy, so revered, that they could not see him as Father. They saw him as just the majestic creator, the omnipotent one, omniscient one. What's the other word? That didn't sound too confident. <laughs> Omno omnipotent. There you go. All powerful, right? Did I not say that? Maybe I didn't. All knowing, all powerful, all seeing. Fancy words to say that. So, they saw him as being just so revered that they wouldn't, they wouldn't even say his name. They wouldn't say his name. And just by the by, when they wrote the scriptures out, different copies of the scriptures, every time they came to the name of God, they would do ceremonial hand washings. They write the name, and they didn't write the name how we would write the name. They wouldn't sort of like say, write Yahweh. They would sort of like go, it's Y-H-W-H, right? I'm just trying to get it. Y, they look looked and copied, Y, Y, W, W, H, H. Ceremonial washing, carry on. So that's how stringent they were with the name. They even just referred to him as the name. Today, modern Jews call him Hashem, the God of Shem. You might hear them say that, right? And so here comes Jesus <laughs> rocking up and he tells these Jews now, you can call God Father. Where did that come from? Father. Yeah, relate to him as your father. Pray to him as your father. What? Teach us how to pray, Lord. Pray like this. Our who are in heaven. Relate to him as your father. Different concept, you see. And that's, that's a wonderful thing to know because perhaps many of us in this room, we didn't have good examples of fathers, right? And if we didn't have a good example as a father, then hear what, fam? You can look to the scriptures and see a very good example of a father. God, our father. Abba, father. We can call him dear, dear father. We can come before his throne boldly. He's a dear, dear father. And so Paul says that he is our father. God is the father of mercy. That's lovely as well mercy he is the father of mercy and paul writes this because mercy originates with god that's why he's the father of it jesus said in john 8 44 he said that satan is the father of lies because lies originate with satan so he's the father of lies but here we see god is the father of mercy that's lovely so we see how god the father is the father of love he's the father of truth he's the father of compassion and grace and he's the father of of mercy and so these are these are heavy things we can hold on to today right <coughs> and what is mercy mercy is not getting what we deserve Who's thankful for mercy, right? Yeah. Mercy's not getting what we 
who deserve. And that's something which Paul could completely resonate with because Paul regarded himself as the chief of sinners. I'm not just a sinner out here. I see myself as the, the chief of sinners. Why does Paul not say that? Because Paul specifically was someone who arrested believers, got believers killed, was on his way to Damascus to go and find people who are of the way, arrest them to bring them back to Jerusalem so that they can get killed or stoned or whatever. And so Paul, throughout his ministry, he saw himself as the chief of sinners. Couldn't believe what this is what I've done to, to my brothers, my sisters. But forgetting those things which are behind him, he says, I'm going to move on. I'm going to press forward for the prize of the goal of the awful calling in Christ Jesus. I'm not sure if I butchered that verse, but do you get the point? Whatever's behind us in our life, we can't do anything about it. It is what it is. We, we can repent of it, ask God for forgiveness from it, and God will forgive us because he's a, a forgiven and faithful God. But you can't live in the past and what happened. You've got to find a way to res reconcile it and move forward, right? Amen? If you don't, it's just going to be like a weight on your shoulder. It'll hold you back. So Paul knew that he was the chief of sinners. And being the chief of sinners and us being sinners as well, we know that we deserve what? A one-way ticket to, to hell. But we don't get a one-way ticket to hell in Christ Jesus. We get mercy. We get what? We don't get hell. We get heaven. And so... We all deserve this because we've all sinned before God, whether I've, I've used this phrase before today, but we've all sinned before God, whether in thought, word, or deed. And James says, if you fall short in one, you fall short in all of them. If you've broken one, you've broken all of them. You're guilty. You're a sinner before God. You need salvation. That's what the scripture says. Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned. And fall short of the glory of God. All meaning all. Ephesians 2, 4. But God, who is rich in mercy. So if you want to know what God is rich in, I just said it. He's rich in mercy. Because of his, not just love, you know. Because of his great love with which he loved, past tense, us. How did God demonstrate his love for us? Because he went to the cross. He said, this is how much I love you. He's demonstrated it. And so because of that, we can have confidence that he is rich in mercy. He is the father of all mercy. Verse 4, God who comforts, comforts us in, our, in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which ourselves are comforted by God. And so, Paul's basically saying that God, the Godhead is united in bringing grace and peace and comfort to his, pe to his people. Comfort to his people. And that's a good thing to think about, right? And it's a good thing to think about because Tribulation is not fun, guys. Tribulation isn't getting a parking ticket. <laughs> Tribulation isn't basically forgetting to pay the congestion charge. You know? Tribulation isn't missing your train for work. Fill in the blanks. That's not tribulation. Right? Tribulation is you might have to die for your faith. You might get put in prison because you believe in Jesus. That's tribulation. It's tribulation. Christianity is the most persecuted belief system in the whole world. It's not reported to on the news. <laughs> but it's the most persecuted in the world. We've got brothers and sisters across the globe who are suffering persecution. And it isn't because, I don't know your, your political persuasion, it isn't because a Labour got in or Labour didn't get in or the concern. It's not that. That's not persecution. It's not fun. And for many of us, life isn't always comfortable. Life can be very, very challenging for many of us. Work can be challenging, right? 
and uncomfortable. Relationships can be challenging, you know, with partners, children, friends, or family, or neighbors. Can be challenging, can be uncomfortable. Our health can be challenging, right? Whether it's our physical health or our mental well-being, it can be challenging. And so, Paul keeps using this word comfort five times within these two verses. He's used this one time. And, and usually within the scriptures, when a word's being repeated, right, it's like, I want to get your attention here. There's comfort. You're going through a bad time, guess what? He's the God of all comfort. And interestingly, the word comfort here is the word paraclesis. Paraclesis. Anybody know what paraclesis is? It's, it means comfort, right? It means to come alongside, right? The para alongside clesis. So what's the clesis bit? It's what Jesus used in John 14, 16. He said the same word, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper. If you've got an original King James, it says comforter, right? Same word. Paraclesis or parakletos. That he may be, he may abide with you for how long? It's a long time, right? <laughs> he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But guess what? You know him, for he dwells with you, and he will be in you. And I will pray the Father. And it should give you another comfort that he may abide with you for ever. That's the promise. Amen? And so Jesus says that the Holy Spirit is the comforter who is going to be with us and he's going to be in us. So it's the Holy Spirit who brings comfort in times of trouble, in times of tribulation, in times of suffering. Now, Moving on, the word for tribulation here now, I, I, I told you it when we went through Matthew, Matthew 24. It's the word called flipsis. Remember flipsis? It's the word called flipsis. Jesus used it and he says that there's going to be persecution. There's going to be tribulation. Same word. It means anguish, trouble. So... Matthew 24, end times. Look forward to some tribulation, persecution, anguish. Amen? So, again, hitting the same now. Flipsis, suffering is a very real possibility for the believer in Christ Jesus. And sometimes we go through suffering and it's our own fault. We willfully fall into sin. And because we willfully fall into sin... We therefore have to pay the consequences of sin, the suffering of sin. Amen? So sometimes it's our own fault. And sometimes the Lord allows us to go through suffering because maybe we're too proud. Maybe he wants to humble us. So he uses suffering to humble you, to humble me. Perhaps he used suffering to, to, to humble the Apostle Paul because remember he says, was it three times I went to the Lord about this thorn in my flesh? And it's like, and I pleaded to the Lord, please take it. He said, my grace is sufficient for you, Paul. You know, so, some people, and I'm not saying this is it, but some people think that Paul maybe, maybe got a bit proud in the situation because he received such revelation knowledge that maybe, I don't know if I agree with that, but some people think that. But... Paul, the, the Lord allowed Paul to go through suffering to keep him humble. Sometimes the Lord allows us to go through suffering because somewhere along the line, he wants to use the suffering we've gone through so that we can help someone else. And so usually when we go through suffering, when we go through flipsis, Usually it gets our attention. You know, usually the Lord is trying so many things to try and get our attention and we just don't want to listen. Not, not listening, not listening. And it's like, and then he's like, all right, let me just put a little bit of suffering, affliction your way. 
you start fasting and praying. <laughs> Phone a friend. <laughs> Gets your attention. But it's true though, right? Isn't that the reality of how we are? Right? Let's not try and make this something what it isn't. That's, that's us. And so he, he, he often, he can't, sometimes put suffering our way. I want your attention. I want you to do this. But always within the suffering, the flip is his desire is that he wants to draw us closer. And thank you so much for what you shared, um, Sister Sarah, today. Because, you know, the Lord is, 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 is intentious to build character. And he's more interested in building our character than he is in our comfort. Even though he is the comforter, he's more interested in our character. And for some of us, can we be real? We did a lot of work in our character, right? Hallelujah. I mean, I'm talking about me. First and foremost, I preach to me. We need work in our character. You know, um, to the married folk, you know that it's either iron sharpening iron or it's it's iron creating sparks. And sometimes it's because the character is being refined and one of us doesn't want to yield to the refinement. You know, but... The Lord puts that boss your way because he's like, there's something in you I want to smoothen out a little bit. He puts that neighbor your way because he wants to smoothen it out a little bit. And he would deal with them. He wants to deal with you. What about that person? I don't care about that person, brother. It's you I'm dealing with here. I mean, I do care about that person, but it's you I'm dealing with. Do you see that? So, suffering. He wants to build character, but equally, as I said, and I think I've already said it, is that some of us can use suffering as a form of just self-pity. Oh me, I'm going through this. Oh my, I'm going through that. And we can wallow in self-pity, and and it's not healthy. The Lord doesn't want us to, to stay there. He wants us to use the experience Learn from the experience, move on. So throughout the whole process, what the Lord is wanting to do, I think it says it says that it's God who works in you both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. So he uses this stuff because he wants to work in you to will and to do, to exercise your will. Not my will, but your will be done, Lord. It hurts. I don't want to say sorry. You know them ones. Just rhyme. Okay. (laughs) He uses these things. He wants to work through us, but he's got to work in us before he can work through us. And so, he uses tribulation, uses trauma, uses discomfort, uses drama, flips this. And the question is, I suppose, that as we go through this stuff, can we be like Job? Job says, though he slay me, yet I will trust him. Job was going through a difficult time, right? I'm going to trust him. Not to say Job got everything right, but I'm going to trust him. And we will fall short. We will make mistakes. But are we going to say, ultimately, I trust him? And so, Flipsis, he takes us through Flipsis, and it doesn't feel good. It's not meant to feel good. But the point I want to make through this is that God wants to build character, and, it, and it's, it's not subject to our feelings. As, 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 as human beings, we put our feelings out there. Oh, I feel to do this, and I don't feel to that. I feel the Holy Spirit. You may feel the Holy Spirit, but the, the Holy Spirit's not dependent on you feeling him or not. You know? You give me a hundred pounds, I feel good. You take two hundred pounds, I feel bad. My feelings can change in five minutes. It goes like the wind, right? You can't base your life on your feelings. You base your life, we base our life as believers in Christ Jesus on scripture. Because stri- scripture is truth. Solid rock, solid foundation. 
And so the promise of God, Jesus, you know, we know scripture is truth because Jesus said, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is, I, your word is truth. I can hold on to that. And so, we go through flipses, but the Lord is with us, and he wants us to stand on his promises, stand on his word. And again, another heavy thing what Jesus said is that, he says, my words are spirit and then life. Tell me someone else who said something like that. My words are spirit and life. You want life? You've got to go to the one who has the words which are spirit and life, right? And so Paul uses this word flipsis and Paul, we can see, was in an ideal position to show genuine empathy towards others who were going through distress because he had gone through distress. And I said it last week that we are in a far better place to show to sympathize with someone, show empathy for someone, if we've been through that thing ourselves. You can understand if you haven't, you know, but if you've perhaps lost a parent or something, then you can understand that someone else who's lost a parent. You can like, you've been, that, you've been down that road, right? So Paul's able to, to show this empathy. I've been there. For the faith, shipwrecked, beatings, stonings, beaten up, robbed. So, now, continuing in our verses, that we may be able to comfort those, see, we go through experiences that we can comfort those who are in trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Now, if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or if we are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope for you is steadfast because we know that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so also you will partake of the consolation. Lots of words, right? Basically, if I can narrow it down, if we suffer, it's for your sake. And if we are comforted, guess what? It's for your sake. And if you suffer, guess what, guys? Just know we're all in this together. We're all in the same boat. And whatever we're suffering as flips this, it's, it's, it's outworking a greater weight of glory, right? So we're all in this together. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our, of our trouble, which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure above strength so that we despaired even of life. Now, if you could just take that verse, you feel pain, right? Can you feel the pain? We, we don't want you to be ignorant of this. Yo, the trouble we got over in Asia, you know, you don't even want to know, but it, we burdened beyond measure above strength so that we even despaired even till to life. Anybody gone through anything like that? See, Paul, Paul knows. He's lived it. And he doesn't mention exactly what the trouble was, but I love the fact that Paul doesn't deny that how he felt. So now I've said that God's not based upon your emotions. doesn't mean emotions are bad. If you feel bad in a situation, you feel bad in it, right? <laughs> it's like you feel burdened above strength and be despaired. They're natural emotions, which we're, but you don't camp in those things. That's the point. You don't camp there. They're genuine emotions, you know, genuine experiences, but they're there to build character. So, yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves. Paul, oh, I'm feeling you, man. That we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. So Paul's just like, if I was left to my own devices and I didn't have a personal relationship with God, I'd be messed up right now. But I'm trusting in God. Because Paul knew, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that God's not giving more than what he can bear. And if it is getting a bit peak out here, that he will give him a way out. 
that way may out way out maybe anything now mm-hmm. and so he's learning in how to trust in himself trust in the lord with all our heart and lean not on our understandings in all our ways acknowledge him and he shall direct our past right and that's a daily task so trust in the lord don't trust in your gifting your ability your talents your wit your charm you know god wants to strip all that stuff down and he wants you to trust in him learn how to trust in him who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us in whom we trust that he will still deliver us i mentioned last week that we see past present and future in this right he's delivered us does deliver us will still deliver us because that's how big god is he's got everything sorted past present future and so paul's reflects on how faithful god has been and how on several occasions that he had delivered him from the point of death along with his companions and as i said what that deliverance is may not always be what we would want it to be right lord deliver me from this situation okay but it's gonna hurt i don't want it to hurt Mm. that's how it is and so again we read through the book of acts right peter's been banged up he's in prison they have a prayer meeting for him prayer meeting tuesday night seven (laughs) o'clock they have a prayer meeting for him Miraculously, Peter gets let out of prison, right? Angels come and unlock the doors, however they did it, and he gets let out and everything. He knocks on the door. Somebody opens the door, (laughs) sees it's Peter, (laughs) closes the door again, (laughs) goes back, and they carry on on Peter. He says it's Peter at the door. Peter at the door. Why, you just let him in? (laughs) You knew he was in prison. (laughs) Anywho, you've got to find joke in the scriptures as well. (laughs) But anyway, he was banged up. But for some some reason god knows he he the lord miraculously delivered him amen james james in the same book gets banged up i'm sure they had a prayer vigil for him too all night prayer meeting shandai shandy james doesn't get delivered beheaded i think he was beheaded i'm not sure he was martyred i'm saying that you know you may watch the god channel and it's deliverance ministry and deliverance there and deliverance there and it's always like oh i got delivered and i got a thousand pounds whatever it may be god doesn't always deliver like that sometimes it may cost you a life that's the reality of christianity it's the reality of the scriptures right deliverance is how he wants to deliver you not how you want to deliver you or i want to deliver me So, whether God wants to deliver us or not, well, the way he wants to deliver us is his prerogative, right? Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego said, Hear, O king, our God is able to deliver us. But guess what? Even if he doesn't deliver us, we're still not going to bow down to your image. Burn us. It's fine. It's all good. We're going to be with him anyway. That's the attitude we've got to have. A couple more verses and and then. You also helping together in prayer for us that thanks may be given by many persons on behalf for the gift granted to us through many. So Paul, again, he's touching upon prayer, helping together in prayer for us. Prayer is one of those things, right? Doesn't cost us anything. Time. Cost us some of our time. And it's probably something which we we all could grow in, right? We could all develop and grow a prayer life. Anybody got prayer partner? Prayer partners. We encourage prayer partners. Hallelujah. Prayer. And if I was God, I'm glad I'm not God, right? <laughs> Maybe I wouldn't have made prayer such a big thing. Maybe I wouldn't. Like, my house is called a house of prayer. 
pray without ceasing. God's decided that the currency to get things moving and get things done on planet Earth is prayer. Maybe I wouldn't have done it that way. Maybe you would, maybe you wouldn't. I'm just saying that we do not always see the importance of prayer, how it changes things. Simple prayers. Oh, sorry, I digress again. So Mike and Teresa, who we're going to Ethiopia with in September. So I met up with them about a month or so ago, right? And so we met up just to sort of like talk and everything, and we was going to have a time of prayer. So I'm thinking, oh, it's going to be some long, deep prayer. <laughs> it was the simplest prayer. And I was like, yo, is that prayer quick? Is that done already? But in my mind, it needed to be a long, elaborate prayer. And it wasn't. And I said to, I, I said to myself, yo, because they go to Europe, Ukraine and different places, they bring Bibles, and where they should pay customs and everything, they just get way through. They go to Ethiopia and they bring stuff and everything, where other people are paying like thousands, of, they get waved through, and they don't know how. And in my mind, I'm like, you must be doing some long, elaborate prayers, you're like really interceding and everything, and I'm so with them, and I'm thinking it's going to be a long prayer, right? Lord, we really thank you for this time. Bless it in Jesus' name. I was like, yo, is that it? You see, you get these preconceived things in your head. It needs to be one way, and it's like, no, it doesn't. Moses prayed for his sister. Lord, heal her. Done. That's what I mean. Some, there's a time and place for everything. Sometimes the prayers can be short. Sometimes it can be long. I'm just saying. What am I saying? Prayer's important. That's what I'm saying. The long ones, the short ones, the ones in the middle too, they're important. And, you know, prayers, Paul's saying they, they helped him during these difficult times. He sees the importance of it. And one or two more points, and I'm going to close. Part of Israel's problem back in the day is that they were unthankful, ungrateful. And Paul's giving up the prayer of thanks here. He says that thanks may be given for many. Thanks to who? Thanks to the Father. They were ungrateful, unthankful. It was like, we've got no bread out here. He pours down manna. We've got no food. He gives them quail. There's no water out here. They're just expectant. God, we ain't got this. God, do it then. I thought God was a genie. They just demanded, ungrateful. And the, the good thing about being New Testament believers is that God changes our hearts. And one thing I can say that most believers are when they come to know the Lord is that I'm so thankful. I'm so grateful I'm not going to hell. I'm so thankful that more than that, I've got a personal relationship with Jesus, the creator of all things. I'm thankful, truly. And so gives thanks prayer is important Jesus said my house should be called a house of prayer Jesus says that men ought to always pray and guess what not lose heart because sometimes you pray and it doesn't really materialize and you're like Lord you're like what's going on and you tarry you tarry still doesn't go on you're like lord what is going on it's like is this really ever going to happen not to lose heart and the lord's answers is usually yes no or wait <laughs> and that waiting can be anything right so you got to know within your own prayer life has he said yes has he said no if he said no let it go if he says yes hold off and learn how to wait. Amen? So, we pray. We don't lose heart. We pray without ceasing. And what is prayer? You know, some of us may say, let us close our eyes and bow our heads and have a time of prayer. Nothing wrong with it. But there's nothing wrong with walking down the road and just speaking to God, because that's what it is, it's speaking to God, right? And you're at the bus stop, everybody around you in your head, you're like, God, let me just thank you for this. You're not saying it out loud verbally, but. But praying to the Lord, right? Doesn't cost you anything. 
but it's something we kind of like park to one side. He uses the currency of prayer to get things moving in planet Earth, to get things changing in planet Earth. Last point, we close. Daniel is praying. He's asking the Lord, and it's like, what is going on? And, and Daniel was lucky. He was only about three weeks. He had to wait, right, for the answer. About three weeks he had to wait for the answer. And the angel pops up and says to him, brother, he didn't say brother, but he said, from the moment you prayed, basically I was dispatched to come and answer your prayer. But I've had some warfare out here. With the, was it the Prince of Persia? Persia is, well, Persians took over, the Babylonians took over the Persians, right? And who now is modern day Persia? Who's created all the trouble all over the place? <laughs> Just saying. Gabriel had a problem back in the day fighting that lot. Spiritually. And there's still arms ass and spiritual warfare going on in that area now, right? Prayer, but he prayed. If he didn't pray, he wouldn't have been dispatched. That's the point. Are we good with that, family? Can we pause there? I've got more, but time is of the essence, and um, I think we're good to pause there. That we need to be praying, praying with all prayer and supplication, praying individually in your own prayer closet, praying with a prayer partner. If you haven't got a prayer partner, then I encourage you to have a prayer partner. Praying corporately on a Tuesday evening where we gather together and we add our amens to people's amens. Hallelujah. And um, yes, and we just want to keep in prayer, if I can ask you, just what the Lord may want to do with us here at Calvary Chapel East Dulwich as we desire just to sort of like fulfill his plan and his purpose for what the life of this church should be, should be all about. Amen. 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 So, Father, we want to thank you for today. Thank you, Lord, that you are indeed, as Sarah pre uh, shared with us, you are wisdom. Wisdom from the Father. And you've become all those things for us. We thank you, Lord, that you may take us through difficulty, through trials, through flips us, Lord, but you are still the para pa paraclete, or the paraclesis, the parakletos. You are the comforter, Lord, who who's with us as we go through these different stages of our life and our walk with you. Continue just to build character within us, Lord. Help us to be more like Jesus moment by moment, um, day by day, Lord, until um, you come for us or we go to be with you, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.